Hello, I'm Skid from the Wildscreen Gaming Forum. Today I'm going to be giving you a very late look at Endless Space. I can only apologise how late this video is, I'm not going to make any excuses, I was avoiding doing it. Anyway, Endless Space is a turn-based 4x strategy game from Amplitude Studio, who are an indie developer. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the company, but they do have a very interesting scheme that you can look up on their website called Gaming Together. And basically what it allows you to do is it allows people who sign up to the site or purchase the game to effectively vote on what the developers should put as a priority for development or in uh, small aspects of the game, so like um, biographies for heroes or um, what heroes, well, I'll get to heroes later, what heroes to include and things like this. Um, so it, it gives um, effectively the community a small amount of power about to effectively drive the direction the game's going. I mean, the developers still have overarching control, but it's always nice to have that sort of thing available because you feel like you can contribute. Anyway, moving on to multi-monitor support. As you might be able to tell from this, um, there's actually a random um, scene that's generated the startup. The game is in fact horizontal plus. There's a few exceptions to that. You've got the loading screen um, that is um, vertical minus, or it's, yeah, that's vertical minus. Um, and there's one exception in game, um, but that's easy to circumvent. I will show you what that is in a bit. Uh, if I just go through the menus here, as you can see, they're all quite happily scaled correctly. There isn't exactly many options for the um, graphics, but you can set up V-Sync and set up your frame rate. Um, there's no field of view slider, but that's not too much of an issue in this game anyway. Uh, lots of audio options. Um, there is a small issue with the interface in that some of them, uh, that's the wrong one, span across the entire screen, and although everything still works, it can make them a little bit trickier to use. Um, there's a better example in game, um, but this screen here, if, if you can actually read the text, you should be able to. Um, allows you to create custom factions so you can modify your, uh, the one of the stock factions how you like and modify what perks they have and things like this but I'm going to load up a game that I've already started because in all honesty the first hundred turns you're probably just going to be building up your empire anyway but this will give me an, a chance to show you the actual problem that I mentioned earlier with multi monitor support so we'll just load this up Right, as you can see, or you should be able to tell, this is actually vertical minus. And there's a very easy way to get around this, and it's, it's perplexing, or to me at least, as to why it works this way. But basically, if I change the resolution after loading the game, it acts as if it's horizontal plus. So in this case, if I change the resolution, it will cut off my side screens and I'll just get the center screen. So it, it behaves horizontal plus. But when you load, it loads vertical minus. So the simple way of getting around this is to effectively load the game at a lower resolution and then once it's loaded, change it up again. So we'll just do this now. I'm going to have to cut the video because I'm fairly sure Fats will not like me doing this, so I'll be right back. And I'm back. And this is maximum zoomed in, so if you remember it from last time, this was a lot closer to, this is my actual home planet, it's my capital. Um, it was zoomed in a lot closer and I can zoom out much further and still be able to see the vast majority of the galaxy. Now, where's the best place to start in the game itself? I'll, I'll go through these one by one. So here we have, um, this is, what do they call it? The Empire screen. So this is effectively all of my um, systems in the Empire and I can monitor my, or monitor my um, population levels here, approval. These are what they refer to as FIDs, which is um, food, industry, um, science and dust, or dust and science is the, since it's FIDs, that's how, how they pronounce it anyway. Um, all of the current system productions, how long they're going to last, and any ships in the hangar. Um, this last option here allows me to set an AI controller, which will effectively, um, op well, it should optimise the planet to for a particular role, whether that's generate dust, generate industry, generate food, um, but it will focus it and then the in the inbuilt AI will build structures for me and whatnot else. Um, from here I can see all my construction list and I can actually summon or make buildings, summon buildings, Christ's sake, sorry. <laughs> right, 
Um, but I can also do that just by clicking on these each individual planets and I get the system view. Now one of the neat things about this game is effectively all constructions or all improvements of the, as they're called in here are done on the system level not the planetary level which removes a reasonable amounts of micromanagement. You still have to effectively configure your system or set up your systems um, to effectively optimize how you want to play but you don't have to do it on a planet by planet level so that makes it a fair bit easier to work with. Um, come back in here. I can also set um, planetary exploitations, which is about the, one of the few options you can do on a planet. Uh, exploitations basically allow you to boost the production from a, or from a particular planet in one of the particular vid areas. So on this, um, this is actually my home world, um, my Terran home world, I've got it on hyperscale farming, which is producing extra food per person on the population. And a lot of the improvements work that way, they work off the number of um, people on planets or the number of people in the systems. If we go next, this is the research tree. Again, this is nice and horizontal plus, so if I zoom all the way in I can see all the um, researchers on the left and right hand side. Um, the, um, I'm saying um a lot. The faction that I've gone with is actually a science-oriented fashion faction. Um, I get a lot of bonuses and uh, effectively research and things like that. Um, but I think on this I focus primarily on upgrading this, I forget what this what the trees are actually called. Ah, Explanation, Exploration, Expansion Technology Tree. So I can colonise pretty much all of the planets with the exception I think of gas giants. Yeah. Um, I've put some into my diplomacy tree and not particularly much in my weapons tree. And when we get to that I'm actually paying the price for not focusing enough military. And then this is my industry tree. We next have the shipbuilder, or oh, it's actually shipbuilder and my fleet management. So we've got fleets on the left hand side and my ships on the right hand side. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute. And then I've got, this is the alliance or diplomacy map. Um, I'm currently in alliance with these two um, AIs here. And I actually made a mistake because when, well not necessarily a mistake, I'm, I'm not regretting it yet. Um, when I invited this guy into our alliance, he was already at war with this guy. Uh, who happens to be the um, most powerful player on the map at the minute. So that dragged me and my um, ally straight into his war. Which wasn't necessarily the smartest thing to do. And then we've got the heroes. Uh, the heroes can be assigned to individual fleets or planets. And they basically they give a v varying amount of boosts and um, benefits. So this one, I've got all of these abilities added to him and he will give me um, food bo production boost, industry production boost. He'll also boost my um, ship's weapons and ship's defenses. So I I've set him up fairly as a rounded character. Um, there is a limit to how many of these you can purchase and they also cost dust as upkeep. Dust is basically the in-game currency. Um, the other ones, food, industry and science. Science is obviously it goes towards research. Food is only really used on a system basis to increase population. Um, food is basic, that's the only thing it's required for, it's not traded into system. Um, industry is used to build things in the system and you can then, um, effectively if you've built all your structures and you've got nothing else to do, you can convert industry into dust. So, if we have a look over here, because I've got a slight problem going on here. I have two pirate fleets. Pretty much immediately after I declared war on these guys accidentally, um, despite the fact I have next to no fleet whatsoever, the AI decided that it would spawn two very large pirate fleets that are about twice the size of mine on this empty planet here, which I forgot to colonize because basically if you expand too quickly, um, the morale on all of your systems goes down. So I thought I'll leave it because it's not really that valuable and I'm paying the price for that decision because I'm going to lose most of my planets here simply through inability to defend them. So we need to try and mitigate this fact. This here is my fleet, it's my only real fleet in existence. Um, I've already sent a uh, very small fleet at this um, enemy here and I know the composition of his fleet. Basically he is exclusively using laser weapons. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify our fleet specifically for the purpose 
of combating his lasers. Basically, shipbuilding... The game's been simplified to such a degree that it it's relatively easy to pick up. There's still some complexity in it, but it means that there's actually a lot more focus on tactics and strategy. And what I'm about to do is one example of that. I know the composition of my enemy fleet, and I know they're using laser weapons. So I'm going to retrofit all of my sh ships with nothing but shields, or active mirror in this case. And that's going to give me a massive disadvantage if someone tries to come up against me with um, kinetic weapons or missile weapons. But it will hopefully give me some defense against um, the pirates, who are my immediate concern. So we're going to retrofit all three of my attack ships. Remove the flak, remove the deflectors. Put active mirror in on them. And with my assault ship, which is my um, uh, second biggest ship. There we go. Right, now to retrofit my entire fleet, or my only real fleet in existence, um, it's going to cost me 1,200 dust, which I'm not going to be able to generate quick enough to effectively take out these fleets before they capture these planets. So I'm going to abandon the attempt at trying to stop them from capturing those planets. What I will do instead is I'm going to stop all production on systems that generate a reasonable amount of industry and convert that excess industry into dust. And this will, if you look up here, boost my dust income. Once I've retrofitted this entire fleet, then I'm going to... Um, uh, that's already dust. Uh, yeah, once I've retrofitted this entire fleet, then I'm going to build another one, effectively, because I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to lose the vast majority of this fleet. I don't think there's much I can do about that. But... If I go down, I'm taking them with me. Sorry, I had to say that. Really bad joke, I know. I can only apologise. I apologise a lot, apparently. Okay, so that will give me 361 dust income uh, in the next few turns. So we'll make sure that he ha doesn't have orders to move. Yep. And he's just blockading that, so we shall progress the turn. I'm actually rather fortunate. Because I allied with the two second strongest players in this game, uh, these guys here and these guys here, they're capturing this planet here. And this planet here is the United Empire's only access to my planets. So if they can capture this, they effectively block the Empire's ability to attack me, uh, which is useful given the fact that I really need to attack these pirates. Now they've sent a very small scout fleet, which is not letting me select, there we go. One ship, and they're trying to blockade this planet. Now blockading a planet basically stops any trade routes and any re strategic resources that effectively are in this planet or in this sector, but it goes one further than that. Any strategic or um, luxury resources generated by these planets here cannot be used in these planets here. So blockading planets is actually a good way to cut off supply chains because strategic resources are required for construction of particular either ships or um, parts. So let's see, does it actually say on the screen or do I need to go inside? I need to go inside, there we go, resources. As we can see here, Heliflemium? I don't know, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that again. That particular strategic resource is required if I want to build this ship. Um, I think it's requ is it required by the ship itself, or is it required by one of the weapons I've got on it? There we go. The advanced containers that boost the, or that I've got installed, that effectively give me extra tonnage, require that strategic resource. So if they blockade um, my planets that have that resource, I can no longer build this ship. But fortunately I don't need to build that ship in the minute, but that said, I'm still going to take these guys out for even trying it. So, what we're going to do first, is we're going to retrofit what ships we can. And I will pick the ones that have leveled up the most, so we'll retrofit... It says I can't retrofit them. Why can I not retrofit them? Oh yeah, because the planet's blockaded, of course not. Right, so my bad, right, we're just going to straight out attack them. Right. Um, attacking, or battles, are actually played out 
um, by the AI, you do have some controls. You can control the tactics, and that works by actually these battle action cards. And basically, um, again, kind of like the weapon system whereby one particular weapon has a particular counter that you can use, um, the battle system works in a similar way where each particular uh, card has a type. So camouflage here is a defensive type, but every card also has a counter type. And if you play a card that can counter a card that your opponent uses, it will entirely nullify the effect of their card and give your effect a boost which will give you a, uh, an edge. So that's one of, the, one of the things I really like about this game. The way it's designed, in my opinion, makes or puts focus on tactics more than it does on simply finding the best build, because every build can be countered. So that basically means that the person that's going to win is the person that can get into the head of their opponent the best, and then find counters or think one step ahead like a game of chess. Uh, that's why I really like this game. But let's have a quick look at this very, very small battle. We're going to absolutely annihilate this guy. He probably doesn't even have any weapons. He's only got 15 military power. 